Hi everybody. Hope you're all having a good day today so far. Today we are going to talk about sequences and their convergence uh, or lack of convergence. So let's, uh, let's get started by uh, reminding ourselves of the definition of what a sequence is. A sequence is, formally speaking, a sequence is a function from the natural numbers into the set where the elements of the sequence or the terms of the sequence lie or where they live. So let's say uh, a sequence, and I'll underline that because that's being defined, although we've, we're just repeating a former definition. A sequence uh, of elements or points in any set is a function from the natural numbers into that set. And I've written the name of the function as x because we often write x for the sequence. And so in fact, let's even say that we usually write uh, x sub n instead of x of n. So for any element of the domain, any natural number, this saying this is a function, we would normally write x of n, but we typically most of the time, write x sub n, and we typically, for the function itself, uh, we typically write this instead of, instead of this. So this would be the whole sequence, the whole function. Um, but one more thing I want, I think we pointed this out before, but I want to I emphasize it again, is that we also, of course, write out a particular sequence term by term. So I would say don't write term by term x1, x2, and so on. You could write that, and it's not kind of incorrect, but this is... Uh, a real uh, recipe for getting oneself confused because this is the notation for a set. And so you would think of this as the set consisting of x1, x2, and so on. And remember, in a set, we, can't, we don't have repetition. But here, it's perfectly okay in a sequence to have terms that occur the same uh, number, the same element x, occurring in different terms. So this is a, a source of confusion and so I wouldn't, I would definitely advise not writing things this way, but writing instead, writing, if you write out the sequence term by term like this, to write it as an analog of an n-tuple. So um, we know that the, so let's say like, uh, like, in fact, let me write it this way. So this, of course, is an element of x to the infinity, x to the, to the infinity, x infinity. And so the particular functions, the particular sequences, it's best to write them this way. This is, avoids confusion, emphasizes the parallel with n tuples in x n, so this is the good way to do it. Um, so uh, let's now uh, go straight to the idea of uh, convergence of a sequence. So let's put that over here. So let's say definition. A sequence. make that, let's give the sequence a name, a sequence, uh, in fact, let's even 
write it this way. So as we said, we would write this for the whole, the whole function like this. Um, but since it's a sequence, we usually write it this way. A sequence, we say, converges to, and so now, uh, let's say uh, that we're talking, first of all, about a sequence of real numbers. So here, uh, let me say here, a sequence in R, a sequence of elements or points in R would be a sequence of real numbers, a real sequence, uh, converges to X bar in R if for every epsilon greater than zero, there exists an n bar in n such that n greater than n bar implies that the distance between uh, term n and the point x, the number x bar, is less than epsilon. So we're going to go through this in some detail. So I'm not just slapping this on the board and then moving, moving on. We're going to spend some time and some examples with the, the definition here, this sort of epsilon definition. But let's first point out, well, first let's point out that the definition has within it the absolute value of the difference between the nth term of the sequence and the number that is going to be the limit of the sequence. And in fact, let's just write that in here right now. We, when this is the case, we write the limit of xn or the limit, well, we usually do write it this way, limit xn equals x bar, and we sometimes write things this way, saying that the sequence goes to x bar as its limit. And so let's actually come back here, though, and point out that um, I wrote this for sequences of real numbers, sequences in R, but, of course, uh, and of course I use the absolute value because I'm in R, where the absolute value makes sense, but everything in the definition uh, just goes through exactly in the same way if this is Rn. So instead of R playing the role of X over here, I could have Rn playing the role of X, and then I have a sequence of points or n-tuples, well, I better not use n-tuples, and I better not use n. Let's call this, and I'm going to try to remember all the way through this lecture to do this, I don't want to call it Rn because I'm using n as the argument of the function x from n to x, that is, I'm using n as the index on the terms. Now, I could use i, that would be perfectly good and might be a better idea because it would be like, xi, where i is 1, 2, 3, and so on, but it's just that this is much more common as the notation for the terms of a sequence than x sub i, and so I'm doing that uh, in the interest of having this kind of square with when we see this other places. So given that, I don't want to be saying that I'm in Rn, because the n is the index is varying as we move through the sequence, all the, all the natural numbers. And R, if I put R in here, well, the n's fixed. That's a particular dimension of the uh, space. So I'm going to use RL. That's a lowercase script L, uh, because actually in economics, it's often uh, the case that in particular models of things, we, we use L for uh, the number of uh, commodities, for example, the number of dimensions in our, in our Euclidean space. So if I say a sequence in RL, I mean a, each of the terms is a vector or an L-tuple, and this would then have to be to a point in RL, and I guess that's the only place where it's showing up here, but oh, 
when we have to do one other thing. Now, since we're no longer in R, but we're in RL, the absolute value doesn't make any sense, but the norm does. So we'll make this a norm. And so now our definition, which we first wrote down for the real numbers, the definition has now turns out to be much more general. Of course, the first one, the first thing we wrote for R is a special case where L is 1 and the norm is just the absolute value. So this works fine for RL. And, of course, we know that we can define norms on vector spaces. So even if we have a vector space that's not RL, maybe infinite dimensional, it's still the case that we could do this. So let's actually use a different color for this. Let's say, alternatively, this could be a sequence of vectors in a vector space. So this would now become V. And this I don't have to change because this would be the norm that we're using in our vector space. And so now the same definition works for any normed vector space, any vector space of the norm. So the vector spaces that we've seen recently, that we've seen earlier, uh, for example, the set or space of all continuous functions on the unit interval, uh, the space of all sequences. So we could have a sequence of sequences that actually shows up. Um, any vector space with a norm on it, this definition is going to work. So uh, right away, let's, uh, let's look at some examples. I like, as you know, I, I like to uh, try to develop things by way of examples. So let's look at some examples. And uh, before uh, writing uh, our examples, uh, let's take this off. So I'm going to take this off, and that'll take a moment or two, and then we'll be right back uh, with some space to work over here when we work out some of the examples. Okay, now we've uh, reclaimed some uh, of our space over here, which we're going to use to actually develop these examples. But let's actually put the examples themselves over here. And let's start with the first example, which is going to be xn equals, let's say, square root of n divided by n, or equivalently, 1 over the square root of n. And so it's fairly obvious intuitively that this converges to 0. And so let's, um, of course, this is for every n. I'm not going to write that down here. Uh, let's say xn converges to 0. So this is this notation here. And so let's give a proof of that. So. Over here, I'll write a proof that this converges to 0. And what I have to do is I have to show, so 0 is playing the role of x bar. And I need to show that for any epsilon that I can find an n bar that will do this. So that's the key idea here. So let's just say proof because we're proving this statement here. And so we'll say, uh, let epsilon be greater than 0. And we need to show that there exists an n bar in n such that n greater than n bar implies that uh, the absolute value of 1 over the square root of n, because that's what's playing the role of xn here, minus 0 is less than epsilon. That's what we have to show. And so what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take this inequality and I'm going to write equivalent inequalities that get me to where I want to go. And this is a little bit of a pattern that's pretty much standard for the way we would go about such a proof for other sequences converging to other limits. And so I'm going to put over here IE to emphasize that 
The next statement is exactly equivalent to this statement here, but it's just this inequality. So this, the zero drops out, so this is the same as one uh, over the square root of n. Uh, absolute value is less than epsilon, and of course, this is always positive, so in fact, that's the same as this. Whoa, <laughs> that, didn't, that didn't come out so good. Uh, let's get that off of there. Okay, uh, that's the same as this. And of course, this is the same as saying that um, 1 over n is less than epsilon squared by squaring both sides, and that's the same as saying that n is greater than 1 over epsilon squared. And so each of these is equivalent. And I, I put the IE in here just to emphasize that I'm not saying this implies this, which implies this, which implies this, all of which is true, but rather that this is equivalent to this, and this is equivalent to this and equivalent. So I can go the other way if I need to, and I will want to in just a moment. So this tells me if I have n large enough, larger than this number here, then indeed it will be the case that this is true, and that's what we need to show. So let's say let n bar be any natural number that is itself larger than 1 over epsilon squared. So let this be anything larger than 1 over epsilon squared. And now we're then going to say that n greater than n bar, obviously then, n greater than n bar implies n is bigger than 1 over epsilon squared. So this is bigger than 1 over epsilon squared. And that's the same as this. So if n is bigger than 1 over epsilon squared, then this is less than epsilon, which is what I wanted to show. I want to show that I can find, exists, I can find some n bar, natural number, such that all the larger natural numbers do this. And that's what we've done. We've picked an n bar big enough that that's the case. Now you might have said, since this is uh, an in a strict inequality, I could have had n bar equal to 1 over epsilon squared. And if 1 over epsilon squared is an integer, that would be okay. But in general, 1 over epsilon squared is not going to be an integer, not going to be a natural number. So I want to take the next actual natural number that appears bigger than 1 over epsilon squared to make this, to make this work. And so that completes the proof. That was a very easy example because this particular sequence, it was easy to see what the, what would be a sufficient and adequate n bar that would make this work. So I actually could find some, notice exist. I only have to find one n bar, but I have to find an n bar that works for this epsilon. So a couple things to notice here. Uh, one, notice that the n bar that I end up using, the n bar that I need, that I find, depends on the epsilon. And so this says for any epsilon, let's back, go back over here, for any epsilon, I've got to find an n bar, but as epsilon moves and changes to, let's say, a smaller epsilon, the n bar that I found out for the other epsilon may not may no longer, I may have to find another n bar. So the, the n bar depends on epsilon, and that's okay according to this um, quantified statement. For every epsilon, I gotta find an n bar, but the n bar can depend on the epsilon. In fact, we sometimes even write it, n bar of epsilon. And so that's what this would say, n bar of epsilon. So I could even write n bar of epsilon. And the second thing to note is that uh, the smaller is epsilon, the larger uh, 
the end bar has to be in general. And you can see that that's actually what came out in this example. The smaller I make epsilon, the smaller epsilon squared is going to be, and then 1 over epsilon squared will be bigger. So clearly I need to make n bar bigger, well here actually, I guess is where I should have pointed. I need to make n bar larger, the smaller epsilon gets. And so another way I could say this is that um, let me write that down here in this card here, and that is um, for these sequences in general, we can do this. We could write down here the first few natural numbers, and this would kind of be useful. So let's write 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, and these are, these are the natural numbers, and they just keep on going. And then I would have xn, this would be x1, this would be x2, this would be x3, x4, and you could say, well, all this is obvious, and of course it is, but I'm trying to, by doing this, and sometimes this is helpful to just do it for oneself, just to be on top of what's going on and be able to get insights. So this just emphasizes several things. It emphasizes that the sequence is a function on the natural numbers because we get an image under the function, a term for each natural number, and so in particular for the sequence that we uh, just did, this would be, uh, this would be uh, 1, this would be 1 over the square root of 2, 1 over the square root of 3, 1 over the square root of 4, all pretty simple and obvious, uh, and this would be the xn's for this particular sequence. And so, where I said the smaller is epsilon, the larger the n bar has to be, another way of putting that is that we could say the farther out in the sequence The farther out in the sequence, we have to go. And by that I mean the sequence is x1, 2, 3, and it goes on like this. And so the smaller is epsilon, the larger the n bar has to be means that I have to go out farther and farther in the sequence to get to the n bar such that all the larger n's will do what I want such that all the larger n's, larger than n bar, will do what I want. And so I just have to go farther and farther out, the smaller the epsilon. Okay, so we're going to see this again in some more examples. So let's do a, uh, let's do a second example. Let's say uh, in our second example, let's say xn is n minus 1 over n which is also 1 minus 1 over n. And again, I think it's kind of obvious intuitively that this sequence converges to the number 1. So both cases, they're real number. In fact, all the examples here today are going to be real number sequences. Um, now, I could prove this directly, exactly like I did over here, saying let epsilon be an arbitrary positive number and find an n bar that depends on epsilon, that will work. And in fact, here I can even say that the, uh, the epsilon that will work is, or sorry, the n bar that will work is just 1 over epsilon, as you can easily check and see, just patterns just like this. So if n bar is 1 over epsilon, all the larger n's, if I go that far out in the sequence, Suppose epsilon is 1 sixth. Then 1 over epsilon is 6, so I have to go to at least 7 to, uh, to be far enough out in the sequence to make things work. But notice, instead of proving this directly, uh, I could prove this in a different way. And that would be, uh, and for that, I'm going to take this off and we'll use this space again to see our first theorem 
about convergence of sequences, and we'll use that as a way to prove that this sequence converges to one. So we'll take this off and be right back.